Greg, I am so happy to have you on the Everything Saxophone podcast. I am really glad that you reached out and you let me know about the uh, project that you were involved in, Know the Legend about Charlie Parker. I can't wait to dive into this with you. I've already learned so much listening to it. Again, welcome to the Everything Saxophone podcast. Yeah, it's great to be here, Donna. Thank you so much. Cool. You know, I, I actually want to start with this project. There's the more like that I listen to it, there's so many awesome stories. Your playing is amazing. Um, and, and you, you know, within this, like you define, you tell us where wood shedding comes from. You tell us how he approached the close, the, the close a etude. So, um, I want to start with how did you get involved in this project? Who funded it? And then we'll go from there. Sure. Um, it started about, I think, uh, less than seven or eight years ago, I had an invitation to go to Mumbai, uh, India. They have one orchestra, the Symphony Orchestra India. It's based in Mumbai, and they had a guest conductor that I did a uh, bird with strings with, um, Peter Borkovsky. And um, he, he started, I mean, he works everywhere, basically, from Boston Symphony to Tokyo to Korea, and Warsaw, Poland. So I've had the pleasure of working with him. And he said, why don't you come um, and perform with this, you know, this repertoire with this orchestra. And also, like, the first half I did the Glasnow concerto, and the second half I did Bird with Strings, like six selections. Um, so from that, they really liked it. They have a jazz festival, and they've had people like McCoy Tyner and uh, Barry Harris and really great players. So it's, I don't want to say it's an unknown festival, but uh, it's certainly off the beaten path. And I, I was, not to segue, because I'm thinking about these these. Uh, the elderly statesman of jazz having to travel like basically there's no way around two days on a plane there's no way around there's not a shortcut to get to Mumbai oh my gosh so guys in their 70s and 80s just you know that kind of turns your head around a little bit but anyway yeah they were very uh, staunch advocates and still are of jazz and I've been there three times with my uh, well, the first time I was by myself and I used local musicians and uh, the second and third time, I used Cleveland musicians. Uh, one great trombonist, Chris Anderson, that played the, the late great Aretha Franklin. Uh, Theron Brown, who played Herbie Hancock in the Miles Ahead movie. He's a local uh, top talent here in Akron, Ohio. And uh, so they've been having my group basically you know, come to Mumbai every three or four years. And they have this series about Know the Legend. And it's not just about jazz artists. It's about... It could be Stravinsky. It, it can be the, it could be a painter, an architect, um, mm -hmm. and it happened that they wanted to really discuss Charlie Parker because that's the first time, uh, you know, there was a, a, a member of the Rolling Stones magazine there, and he, um, uh, Sunil Sampa is his name, and, and he knew Bird with Strings very very intimately, so he was like kind of reluctant at first. He couldn't believe it could be pulled off. And um, they, they really were happy that it happened. So it just kept on going from there. Then we recorded it uh, with an orchestra in Europe called the United Chamber Orchestra, which is comprised of musicians from Eastern and Western Europe. And it just kind of took off. So they, they invited me to do this series. We, we filmed it where I teach at the Cleveland Institute of Music. And they just sponsored it, and they, they put it out. As, and people, it was during uh, COVID, unfortunately, so they had people purchase tickets, and they had it in their theater. And it's just wonderful to to work with these people. They're really uh, they're really great, and they uh, will be going back, I think, next January. Uh, and and what I like about them, Donna, is that they're very uh, articulate in having a theme to a concert. So it's not just like blowing tunes, so to speak. Uh, they uh, we we did they requested New Delhi from Cannonball Adderley and um, so the, the um, aspect of them really understanding the music well is, is astounding. You know they had Arturo Sandoval there last year, so they understand great jazz. Uh, this this season, which I think is happening in a few weeks, they have Vincent Herring, a wonderful alto player. He oh, sounds yeah. loud. He sounds great. Uh, so they they know what good and bad is, and they were just it just kind of all worked out. Um, yeah, 
That's so cool. And and uh, I wasn't aware that Know the Legend wasn't just, you know, just for Charlie Parker. You know, you mentioned Stravinsky and, and you know, and others. That's that's actually really great. That's fascinating to know. I'm going to have to do a little bit of searching <laughs> for sure. And my first thought, too, is that, you know, the YouTube link that you sent me, um, the first thought that comes to mind is that not only anybody interested in Charlie Parker should watch this, but anybody interested in jazz improvisation or students, you know, whether they're in high school or going to college, I think that this is so good. And I think it's just, there's so many, there's so much good information in there. I think everybody should honestly be watching this. Well, I, I appreciate that. I, I did put a lot of thought into it, although you know, speaking yeah. about Parker and uh, kind of, Coming from that school, uh, you know, and having the honor of studying with Jack and McLean side by side, you know, that was Parker's only student. So when, when Parker passed away, Miles said, get, get Jackie. He, he wasn't even sure of his name. He says, get that young man from Harlem that, that Park Bird's been working with. Because Jackie knew all the heads. So when when Bird passed away, Miles was kind of like, who's going who's gonna to stand side by side? No one knew confirmation, Donna Lee. All this stuff. I mean, people kind of knew it, but the person that knew it first and foremost was Jackie McLean. So Jackie got on the band, and you know, it's in the Quincy Trope book, uh, the Miles autobiography. His first time sitting in, he was pretty nervous. He was like sixteen or seventeen, and he was playing with these legends. Although there wasn't much of an age difference, I think Miles was twenty-five at the time. He was uh, he stood his own. You know, that's a <laughs> that's like playing in the major leagues when you're a young man, in person. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, I did read that Quincy Trope book. That was, that was, that was definitely a book that was really, really fascinating. Um, getting inside of Miles Davis for sure. But I, this, this is, goes to the question I was going to have is how do you s share so many great stories in there? And I was wondering how you, you know, you, you learned about all these stories. A lot of them I've never even heard of before. Um, was it through Jackie? A lot of it was through Jackie and then him. As time went on, embracing me into kind of his musical family, you know, um, and uh, allowing me to meet, you know, people like Dizzy Gillespie and and Sonny Rollins. I remember <laughs> having um, breakfast with Sonny Rollins and, and Jackie at the Pleasant Valley Diner in Poughkeepsie, New York. Okay. There's, there's a great saxophone repairman in there. He's now in Marcellus, New York, named Ed Defes, D I E F E S. And he, they just loved his work. Sonny was in, or was in Germantown, which wasn't too far. And Jackie was was checking out my horn. He goes, how do you get such a, uh, an older horn so tight and clean? And says, well, this, this great repair guy in Poughkeepsie um, does this. So we, I took him up that one time. And then he called Sonny. And you know, as time went on, we would have these road trips. And I didn't say much. I, w I was just pretty nervous, uh, you know, but... I just, you know, we would have the horns dropped off, the saxophones, and we'd go to this place called Pleasant Valley Diner, and they had these, these typical New York State breakfast, you know, yeah. they were like, you know, five plates deep, <laughs> and uh, we just had a blast, but they, they it was kind of funny, because they would never talk about music, they would talk about, like, you know, war stories, or, you know, wow. uh, things that they did as like, children and stuff, the son was a little bit older, but they came, you know, from the same area, so to speak, in New York. And, um, you know, just they would just uh, talk about sports or something. I never heard one aspect about talking about equipment or saxophones. We we're just talking about old times. Interesting. So th that's sort of how all this came to be because I also wrote for the Saxophone Journal, I think, for I don't know how long, 25, 30 years. And, um, and, and I never, it, it just, I was, I've really been fortunate to have all these experiences because another great uh, you know person that we, we lost not too long ago was phil woods and yeah. phil did his last <laughs> master class at uh, case western reserve where i also teach and that was awesome yeah. and so just getting in and, and phil actually studied classical saxophone with my uh teacher vincent abato from julia so it all quite sort of comes full circle so you just start connecting the dots and um i was I guess I was just at the right place at the right time, or, or I more so I chose to be around the best people and players they could be all the time, and I still do. They're they're just younger now. It's crazy what people are doing. I have students that boy they they can play. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh my gosh, this is awesome. So, um, with, with, well, actually, um, where are you initially from? Uh, Buffalo, New York and like the Lower East Side of Buffalo, New York, like, um, um, I guess the more socially depressed area, it still is. Um, but it was when I was a child. So, it, you know, music for me was a gateway to, uh, still continue going to high school and, and things. It was, it was a rough neighborhood in the late sixties and seventies. So uh, a lot of it's been like leveled and things like that, but um, that, that's where I, I grew up from. And then I did my undergrad at the Hart school of music in Hartford, Connecticut. And then from there, you know, I just met so many great people because we had at one point Ron, every week there was a different master class. So Ron Carter was in, Curtis Fuller was in. I, and every week there was a living legend just speaking about the things that I pontificated in the, the Parker documentary. But I mean, all this knowledge I just accrued year after year between that, uh, you know, wonderful teachers and great schools. And, um, you know, and, and the saxophone journal had a big part to do with it because I was allowed. To, to interact and communicate with these players and these people. So it was great. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, I'm asking this because um, I'm going to ask another question too. So growing up in Buffalo um, and the connection with heart. Um, so when you, when you were, um, when you were growing up in Buffalo and your music, you know, your, your music studies in schools and all that kind of thing. I'm really curious about this because, um, I'm certified in something called music learning theory and Buffalo is one of the hotspots for that, as well as Rochester, New York and Hart School of Music. Um, that particular area. I know John Firebrand is big over there too, but, um, I took a couple of courses. Um, I took many courses at Hart actually, but one of them was with Chris Azara who taught, um, building creativity through improvisation. It was for music teachers to help them teach people how to improvise. But I don't know if, if you had with your music background, if you were taught, you know, like, for example, rhythm syllables like do and do day and stuff like that, or is that not part of what you were taught where you were? Oh, I think it was more of an organic approach, like hearing, like, um, you know, dizzy scat. And things okay, like so that. it's different. Okay, it's different because I was thinking bit. about that connection between like the Buffalo Rochester area and Hart with regard to that. I was just really curious about that. So let's let let me take a left turn. Let me ask you then: What was your music experience like growing up? Like, was saxophone your first instrument? That kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, saxophone was. I didn't um, know what I wanted to play, but I was, my mom was, you know, she has a, an amazing record collection. You know, so she had Kind of Blue and Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto. I just like listen to records, but I couldn't put my finger on what I wanted to play until I heard Phil Woods, like, I'm just the way you are. Oh, yeah. and, and it was like electricity went, I, I didn't know what the instrument was. I says, Mom, I, Mommy, I want to do that. She, I says, What is that? She goes, Well, that's a saxophone, Craig. So, you know, two weeks later, we, rented a saxophone and you know pretty typical uh, i had a great teacher right off the bat it was named dave chavone um so he played with the amherst saxophone quartet doc severinson just a really a woody herman wow. so i had from age 10 someone that showed me how to put the instrument together just a really world-class teacher played buffalo philharmonic um and dave uh, you know, dave sounds <laughs> he sounds great um and the other thing about Buffalo at the time, which was so paramount in like learning, is like four blocks away, Grover Washington Jr. was from the lower side of Buffalo. So he was there prior to just the way you are. So he was just playing on the street, you know, in clubs around the neighborhood. And so you could hear his sound. Spyro Gyro worked at the faculty, at, we're on faculty at Edwin's Music Store. And so before they were Spyro Gyra, Oh they were all basically working in the music store and the lesson for six dollars and a half an hour so all those guys were just playing in clubs so that whole area was just uh, wow. permeated in great jazz the guys like don menzo was from buffalo um well maynard would get his sax section and woody herman from from the buffalo area because they were just you know gary keller is another person who played with woody herman that, that just retired from the university of miami he, He's a Buffalo area guy, and uh, it was, there were just so many players and so many clubs to play in, and so I was really fortunate. I mean, the neighborhood wasn't the greatest, but music helped me gravitate to uh, a better life. Yeah, and what I'm hearing already, so far a theme I'm hearing, 
And this is based on, again, watching the Know the Legend, how you your research is so deep and how you're finding out these personal stories and, and you know, um, how things truly came to pass. And it's it's coming from where you grew up and all these influences, influences that were around you, you know, even some of them, even before they were big names, <laughs> like Grover Washington Jr. and Spira Gyra, but, you know, also then the connections that were made and then, then going to heart and then the teachers there, you know, um, all this stuff really set the, the foundation for you. Yeah. And I also, you know, I, I, I always took my education very seriously. I worked as a stage, uh, a stage hand, stage manager, it was basically a, an overrated janitor. I, I worked about 30 hours a week, like every week for forever. So there were times I, I slept in the building, uh, which, which was fine. I just received their uh, alumni achievement award. Um, and I was just telling the students that, you know, that was my, um, uh, and, and not in a negative way, it was actually great. I mean, I, I, I just really appreciated my education. And I, I took John Fire Robin's first class when he was doing learning theory when he was a, a, a younger man. And it was a class that was only offered on Wednesday evenings. And I, I took it because I always knew I wanted to teach. So I wanted to like crack the code on how the process is. So I, I, uh, I had one side of me that it was an organic approach to learning saxophone. And the other side was uh, you know, pretty methodical about like, do A, A, B, and C, just just knock out these steps to you know, really be disciplined in my formal education. Okay, let's dive into this organic versus, I'm going to say, you know, I guess how most people are taught, which is like through method books and stuff. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm kind of going through that right now, and I always go through it. Like, uh, I think there's no lines between classical and jazz now maybe thirty thousand people would light up the phone so to speak in an interview and the classical guys would say this and maybe the jazz personnel would, wouldn't really care uh, but it's just basically good and bad music so to me like i think the organic side is like you have to you have to use your ears and your intuition so i'm always amazed that I know a lot of orchestral players, and I'll be like listening to Dvorak New World Symphony. I'm like, wow, listen to that whole tone tonality. Like, they they may or may not hear it that way. They hear it's like my part is second oboe in San Antonio Phil, and I am playing these sixteenth notes, and that's and that's that's a world of difficulty in itself when orchestral musicians. Uh, so I, I just hear things differently. It's just like looking at a painting. Some people see this, some people see that. Um, so I don't I want to say I maybe when I was younger I fought it because you need the discipline to have the methodology of, of learning the exact rhythms and dynamics and articulation and everything else honed into our craft. But then it has to at the end of the day I think the organic thing is it has to be expressive. And you, how do you teach expression? Yeah. So it's ears. I, it's ears. It's hearing. It's hearing others. Yeah. And it's okay to say you like this and that too. I mean I know so many players like. If you like the Rolling Stones, or uh, there's a great saxophone player I, I worked with a little bit when he was in high school. Uh, his name's Steve Cortica, and he plays with Tony Bennett and Lady Gaga. And he was from Parma, or is from Parma, Ohio. I had him as a guest teaching uh, for me at my schools, and I, I was on tour a little bit and during COVID. And uh, there's a good example of like you don't have to be from New York City or Chicago yeah. or LA, you just have to work hard. You know? Yeah. Um, Art Tatum was from Toledo, Ohio, and I still don't know what Art's doing. I mean, he was playing upright piano style. <laughs> so good. Yeah, for sure. So you talked about like using ears and using t intuition. So when you started out, that's that's what you did for the most part, or, or did you follow a method book? Yeah, I, I went through the Rubank method book uh, and things like that. But I always, I, I couldn't help it that the once I got bit by music so to speak i would try to figure out things just by putting a record on dropping the needle on a record okay. so i would try to figure out like uh, tchaikovsky violin concert like the slow movement on saxophone i i, I immediately tried to figure out things uh, on I, I just thought that's what you do so i would try to figure out things on the radio or records or whatever i heard or you know as soon as i could play i was already playing with bands quicker than i probably should have but um 
you know, just to play with a drum set, you know, whatever it was, I, I just thought it was amazing. And then my first experience playing with like a lot of musicians, I never knew that was possible because I was still kind of like insulated. I just thought all musicians just use their ears and play and I would try to figure out film scores and stuff like that. And I still do. I, I used to do it more. I used to have more fun doing it. I would play alto flute to like horror movie soundtracks just for fun. Nothing, <laughs> nothing to do. Just to like, um, um, I don't want to watch TV and I would figure out those old Bella Lugosi movies and Boris Carla, who's on alto flute till like three in the morning. But <laughs> yeah, no, I stopped that for a little while. But I have fun doing it. I, I should do it more, actually. And what's interesting is that, you know, you're mentioning like a drop the needle type of thing with classical types of pieces or, you know, film scores, you know, which were much different back then than they are now. Um, and it's interesting because a lot of people, you know, that I've spoken to would drop the needle or, you know, listen to vinyl records and try to transcribe jazz tunes or, you know, Charlie Parker or this or that or whatever. So when did you, um, you know, when did you start doing that kind of thing? As soon as I could. I mean, I just thought that's what you do. Is okay, so like both at the same time. Okay, got it. Yeah, so I thought like cool. learning G, 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 A, A, doing that. And then I was... You know, uh, I just thought that's what the ultimate goal was, was just playing with, I felt like I was, and I still do, maybe I was, uh, I think, being a little more naive when I was younger, uh, assisting me. Like, I just thought I was playing with those people. I just thought that was like a conversation. It was, it was really fun, you know, uh, for me to just play with, you know, Duke Gellington or play with Frank Sinatra recordings and Count Basie. And yeah, I would just have fun. It reminds me of my trumpet teacher who he would always say that, um, you know, you always want to imagine yourself playing with the greatest orchestras, you know, the greatest bands and use your, your imagination that way. And you were, you were doing that with playing with these recordings. Yeah. And I, I need to just, you know, we get older and we forget that, um, you know, uh, enjoyment aspect of it. Now I, I play because I have to play, but I still have that locked away somewhere my DNA, so to speak. I still want people, I still think about the audiences and what they're hearing and I want them to be happy. You know, you don't have to play like a thousand notes. Like, oh, that was a great Grover Washington quote. He said, you don't have to play a thousand notes to let someone you know you can play the saxophone and soul and stuff. And, and he certainly did that. And he left, left, lost him too soon, unfortunately. It was just on a morning TV show and it's, the, the lights acted, you know, just had something happen with his heart, you know, with blood pressure and all. You know. Yeah, it's <clears throat> some of the greatest people. I, I think recently also of like Roy Hargrove. That was uh, such a great, great player, great, yeah. great jazz trumpet player. You know, and really young too. Um, you know, I mean, it's like what fifty one something around there. But uh, yeah, such Wallace a shame. Crony, right, Wallace. Uh, yeah. Wallace, I, I used to hear a lot when I lived in uh, New York and Hartford. And yeah, these guys are uh, all too soon. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. So so now I want to bring this back to, you know, you've got this this rich foundation growing up and you're bringing this to heart school of music and stuff like that. Did you have any kind of um, and I'm going to I want to tie this to the Know the Legend project. Do you have any fascination with Charlie Parker in particular or were there other people that, you know, um, influenced you more? Because there's there's two ways to go with this. There's the classical influences, and there's also the jazz influences. So, you know, can you talk about those? Well, when I first heard, again, I had this great teacher who would say, you, you, if you're going to study with me, you have to buy a record a week, which was like three or four bucks or whatever. And he goes, check out some Charlie Parker. And I would go to a place called Sattler's on Broadway Avenue in Buffalo, and they had a little record shop. And... I remember picking up a Parker album, and when I first heard it, I didn't even think it was a saxophone. I mean, I knew it was, but I, I, I was used to hearing, you know, saxophone and maybe a pop idiom or what pre-pop. Oh, right. Yeah. So, okay. Um, I didn't know the, you know, the velocity or, you know, bird sound, uh, like Shan Parker attests to, like, it, it wasn't like it's stereotypical tone that she heard from Johnny Hodges and Ben Carter. You know, a bird sound is so unique. It's like a laser, people would say. And I would have loved to hear it. it you know, I, I could only imagine because I, I stood side by side with uh, you know, 
Jackie McLean with his song you could hear 20 miles away, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm not, yeah, that, that's part of it. Yeah. Okay. So then, you know, so some of those early records, you know, um, influenced you and were there any other, uh, I guess, aside from Grover Washington Jr., were there any other mentors or classical mentors that you liked? Well, there was only one record at the time of uh, uh, classical saxophone, which was Vincent Abato, and I never thought I would study with him, so I would listen to that. Uh, and that was like trying to get into music schools and auditions. Uh, and I just, I didn't even think it was a saxophone then because, you know, having worked with him years later after graduate school and studying overseas, I just wanted to know how it was. Like, he, he was a person that, uh, place that saxophone classically because he wanted to not because he couldn't swing or anything else like that he also played with the dorsey band he never took solos but he was in the section too so this was a guy um, you could youtube but i think it's saxophobia he was playing on mitch miller's show sunday night at seven o'clock playing like you know kind of he's playing classical saxophone like you know he's playing pieces by memory he hated that people that used music stands he did everything by memory because uh, he said he could be expressive and stuff. So uh, going back full circle, so I I heard him on vinyl, and I was like, wow, that's a gorgeous sound. It still is. It's still like the definitive classical saxophone recording. I mean, one of them, you know, historically. Um, but so I heard that, and I just thought it was awesome that saxophone could sound like that. It sounded like a voice in a cello. And uh, later on, when I went to study with him, I, I graduated hard. And he was uh, already long since retired, but he was three hours away in Malvern, New York, is where he retired from the oh. Philharmonic. Okay, Long Island, yeah. 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 So I would drive three hours one way for a lesson and it had to be at nine in the morning. And I had a gig on Fridays and Saturdays at a place in Hartford called on Main Street called Max on Main. So I'd play the gig till about two in the morning. Oh I would God. go home, practice, then get in my car because lessons had to be at nine in the morning. Oh God! So I traffic. Had to leave at five thirty, or and, you know, there's always traffic on the GW. Oh, yeah. So what I did was uh, I just stayed up, and and all those things years later before he passed, it was really interesting, Donna, because he said, you know, I was doing that to show you that when you travel all over the world, you have to sound great when you're feeling fatigued. When you, he had a reason to do that. I said, "Can we do this later?" And I have gigs. And I, I was teaching at the time, you know, various music stores, and he said, "No, I'll see you at nine. Promptly, the baton goes down at nine with every orchestra all over the world." Wow. So, uh, it was. I, uh, you know, a lot of people thought he was difficult, and probably still to this day, the few people left around town um, still got, you know, thought he was kind of salty uh, just because that was his personality. And no, he was just. He was just like that because he cared and he knew what it took. So if I travel, you know, 13 hours, 14 hours, I get off a plane and I, I go to a rehearsal. You know, there's no more time where you, you have to like acclimate to the time zone and things like that. You just have to sit down. And the first thing, especially in going to foreign countries, I, I speak very little Korean and going there, they never had a saxophone with orchestra. So that rehearsal with that group is the, truly the performance. And that's what I was learning from him is that it sound great right off the bat all the time or the best you can. That's a great lesson. That really is a great lesson. And, and it's so interesting how you said this too. Um, you described it as like a salty, you know, kind of personality and stuff. But I think in certain respects, people have to look deeper into, you know, that sometimes people will be very dismissive of people. Um, and it's probably because they don't want to do the work, you know, and they don't want to look deeper into into why that person is acting that way. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, um, well, if he didn't carry, what well, it's easy not to say anything. And he, and he, you know, the, and all the great people I worked with, I, I I always heard them practicing. You know, I would get to their home, a little home studio, like a little earlier. There wasn't a time where I never saw Jackie without a saxophone in his hands. And he wasn't doing that for any reason. Well, you know, I remember uh, he received a phone call and he was he was talking and he was saying, like, Bill, just don't worry about it, Bill. Everything will be okay. You just get those people together and get them talking. And he was talking to President Clinton when, before they had the date in the court in Kosovo. Because oh, Bill's and they, he was at the White House and paid for them. So he's like, just, you know, just make them relax and get them talking about this and that or their travels. And 
So Bill Clinton called Jackie to get advice on how do I get these people together to talk? And, and he goes, Ed Craig, I got to take this call. And I was just in a lesson. And uh, wow, I was like, so I said, that's the, and I saw in his mantle, he had photos of him and the president with his wife, Dolly, in the plane. And it just floored me. I, it, I walked away. I was like, I, I, I don't want to say I didn't believe it, but I still don't. <laughs> Oh, my God. You have the best stories. Oh, my God. All right. <clears throat> Speaking of stories now, I'm going to bring this to the Know the Legend Project. And there was, um, can you, There were, <clears throat> I made a note, woodshedding. Okay. Can you talk about the story behind woodshedding, why we call it woodshedding? Oh, it's just that Parker would go in his woodshed <clears throat> and he would just practice incessantly. And his, um, he and his mother almost got evicted because he was practicing so much. And he just... It, you know, the one thing that comes to mind is like, hey, it had to be, you know, it was, had to be small, had to be hot. And he would, there's, there's some uh, YouTube footage, which is great now that younger people could hear Parker talk. And, and he said, you know, specifically, I put a great deal of time into my instrument. And he said for several, you know, for many years. And, and uh, of course he did, because when you hear these recordings, I know he didn't have the same saxophone, same mouthpiece, same reed. He was just getting them from whomever. And I don't, I never heard a recording, which many people don't talk about, especially some classical players that may not really understand Parker, is that he's always in tune, even if it's a little, he chooses to do whatever he wants. He's always dead center and he's certainly not squeaking. I, I had the pleasure of playing his mouthpiece and I thought I was going to really, the only thing I figured out about playing that, that Brill Hard, is that it was really resistant and it was, a, it was a number four. It was so he was playing on a hard setup, and he was getting that sound, and that's just how he played. So I, and I even felt his teeth grooves, which is a little bit to the right. Um, so that just gave me a, a, a like a bird's eye viewer intuition of like how you know, how he was playing. It wasn't you know we all if you got Yasha Hypus violin, you would think it would be magnificent or Bird's saxophone or Dizzy's trumpet, and uh, yeah, the, mecha the mechanism was uh, really beat up. The mouthpiece was like, rough to play. And you, you said it that he learned, it's not like he practiced patterns necessarily, you know, but he learned his instrument really well. Yeah. And w do you have any stories with regard to, and, and I referred to this before we started actually, but, you know, he would practice classical things. He would practice the close etudes and, 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 uh, you know, classical pieces and that kind of thing. But do you have any more insight you can share in into, like, you know, the types of things that he practiced? And also, you know, we've heard stories that he practiced 11, 12 hours a day. I mean, was the horn in his mouth for 11 or 12 hours a day or was a lot yeah. of it listening? I think it was for the most part just, just practicing because, you know, he would roll up the close A book in his bell and it was pretty, you know, beat up and tattered. But every A2 to him, he would take in different keys and then he would take in different, like the, 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 the page number three, he would play like a rumba, a samba, a ballad. So who, who does that? I mean, yeah. you barely, you, know, you just run through page three, you flip to page four. And he was thinking about, like, his, this was the only toy or block he had to play if he's a child, which he was a young man. You know, yeah, he was, what, 13, 14 years old. So he was just turning it upside down, left and right. Um, and and he, uh, so I think hard work combined with genius is, well, I mean, he goes beyond having perfect pitch. I, I know he had, uh, you know, his rhythm I can't even explain it. Like, um, I, I don't, the, you know, to use the term perfect pitch and perfect rhythm. Um, he, and when he's playing, he's just, you know, um, just a command playing. of the subdivisions and stuff like that. Just a, oh, everything, everything. Just, um, I, I think if this makes sense, um, Parker um, heard and we heard, we hear melody and harmony. And rhythm so melody goes up and down harmony is kind of like fabric and rhythm just kind of wraps it all up so it's like he's hearing which i i don't know i could only basically describe it from my experience it's like he's almost hearing in like three like a, a three-dimensional sound like when you see in a model or something of that nature or when i see a melody it goes up and it goes down harmony i plug in the chords and I figure some things out um, who I'm playing with and rhythm I'm listening to drums or, or 
percussion section and an orchestra, but he had all that happening together. So there had to be there, there, there's this within his DNA. There was a genius there, of course, obviously. You know, he transcended the saxophone just like Coltrane did. You know, um, yeah. Do you feel with Parker, he transcended the saxophone? Do you feel that his talent? Um, let's see. I want to use the word innate, but it was really it was a lot of hard work as well. Do you think that that this three dimensional kind of view that we're you know you're kind of alluding to that was developed in the practice room, or do you think that it was something in him that just needed to be brought out? Probably half and half. I think the more he started to dig, the more he started to realize that he had that innate ability, which is you know that's a great way to put it down. Like he. He was able, he was like, wow, I could throw the ball 70 yards if he was a football player. And people, he didn't even realize what he, the skills he had. Um, you know, uh, and, and he had a great teacher, you know, from Jamie Shanban, the Valka player was Buster Smith. No one listens to Buster Smith. And I, I mean, there's not many recordings of him, but yeah, you, you hear Parker within you, you within Buster Smith you hear the influence that Parker had from Buster Smith obviously um, but then Parker's technique just is at a different level he just started hearing and thinking faster and faster yeah you know what's interesting with that too and I, I wrote this down it was like he approached the close eight book or anything as the only toy or block to play with and you know, it's, what's really fascinating too. I think this is a generational thing as well. Uh, people that were brought up before computers, like my mom would say, go outside. She'd throw me out of the house. <laughs> you know, you, know right. you had to get creative and do something, you know, with that. Um, whereas it's so different today. Kids have everything at the, you know, at their fingertips, video games, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, y you sometimes wonder if creativity is being built or it's just being built in a different way or whatever. I, I just found that really fascinating. Uh, you know, the way he approached that and whether someone guided him to think that way or he just thought that way. And um, can you, that's one point. But the other thing too is like his background, you know, with, with you know, the way he was brought up and was, were there any musicians in his family, you know, in his family tree, so to speak, that may have influenced him? I, I think it was more of the area where he was, you know. True, Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it was that. But certainly, I mean, when he went to New York City, I mean, he just hopped, hopped on a train. You know, like, you know, he didn't certainly have a ticket. He just jumped literally on the train. There was no saxophone in his hand. And he was washing dishes, um, you know, for $9 a week just so he could hear our tape and play piano. So his drive to to just seek out things, I mean, was, was ravenous, you know. His musical appetite was um, just, yeah, who knows? Um, and, and people allude that to like classical, just musicians, I even hate the labels classical jazz, you know, it's all good or bad music. But um, I'm sure Stravinsky had long nights trying to put the Rite of Spring together and things like that. It didn't happen overnight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it, let's get back to Art Tatum because you shared an awesome story um, in the Know the Legend you know, in the video, in the project, and you were saying how <clears throat> Charlie Parker would listen to Art Tatum every night, and he would, tran he would like, transpose that, so to speak, for saxophone. So in other words, Art Tatum, with all the harmonies and all that kind of stuff, and Charlie Parker would put that, you know, um, on the saxophone, like, just transcribe that, so to speak, for saxophone, you know, uh, saxophone playing and technique. Yeah, I think if... If, the, if you look at the saxophone and lay it across your lap and look at it as a keyboard, that's how Parker viewed it a little bit. So he just said, well, why can't I play with that velocity and precision? I don't know. I, I don't want to use the word fast because fast without direction doesn't mean anything. But, but precision, uh, rhythmic intent. Um, they, uh, and, and I never hear Art Tatum play wrong notes. And he was... You know, he was uh, had a loss of vision in his right eye. So a lot of things that Tatum was doing was just creating, you know, at will. Uh, I don't know. I mean, we certainly had to practice incessantly as well. Or playing music, I should say. It's kind of funny when I, I go home um, and they say I have to practice. I'm like, mm, but if I'm going to play my sax, I feel good. Okay, let's play. 
<laughs> well, all right. I'm going to, I'm going to take a right turn here for a second. Then I, I do want to get back to some stories from here, but I did want to ask you about your own practice routine because the, the thing is this, a lot of you alluded to this, you know, people will say, okay, are you a classical or are you a jazz musician? You know, when it comes to, you know, uh, saxophone and all that kind of thing. Uh, but you know, you just said you don't really like those, those, those not terms, but, um, labels so to speak, sure. but you play both incredibly well. So when it comes to your own practice routine, what does that look like on any given day? Well, I, I, I kind of like, I just play the mouthpiece, um, you know, to, not to be, you know, just play the mouthpiece. I make sure everything's really in tune we had at 840 and all the notes that don't want to be in tune. Um, then harmonics, you know, going from the Sigurd Rasher school because I'm still from upstate New York and that's where Rasher was from. So that was an influence there as well, you know. And I think he sounds great. I mean, I don't, yeah, anyone playing this, it's awesome. So I'll do like harmonics and overtone series, you know, with Dave Rubin, the solo student about writing, about pedagogically. He did great books to develop a personal saxophone sound. Um, he really breaks it down. Don Sinta, uh, professor at Michigan, uh, and he also taught, taught at the hard school in his earlier years. He was doing those things before there were publications. And things about it. I find that's really good to do one with the instruments. And there's scales and different patterns. Um, and, but I always try to be creative. Like recently, uh, I was playing along with some CD and it got, it got stuck. So it was like skipping. Da, 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 da. And instead of like stopping, you know, just, I just started to articulate it. And so you could you could learn from like Buster Rhymes. You don't may or may not like his um, the lyrics per se, but you could just rhythmically just articulate with any you know pop or rap singer and just do it. You know, it gives you a different perspective or respect for what they're doing. You know, yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> I love yeah. that. That's a great idea. <laughs> yeah, so I'll do things like that just to keep things real, so to speak. I, I try to. Uh, and I don't want to call it, you know, I don't look too big. I'm not trying to challenge myself. I'm just trying to keep my playing fresh. So I never, it's kind of weird because I, I don't look, you know, who, who listens to their CDs once they're done? I just hear the things they want to do better. I, I've only, I, I have a number of CDs out and I only listen to them when I get them the box in the mail. And I'll open it up and I'll listen to make sure what are people hearing, what they're going to buy, and stuff like that. And then I, I don't ever re listen to them again. Uh, and that it's not because uh, I, I know uh, you know hopefully I could do it better. Some things I can't. I made a record and cassette in 1991, but prior to CDs, and I was I was really playing like I was really focused on classical saxophone. I can't play along with my own fingers now, or even 10 years ago, and it was live, so that's kind of weird, but <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> yeah, because the thing is that you know. In life, we go with a different focus here and there, and and you, you, you're we're different people, you know. After every so so many years and stuff like that, and you've focused on different things, and you know, back then it was probably really just very technical, and right. yeah, and and now you know, a breadth of knowledge and all that kind of stuff. Your 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 mindset is probably way different too. I would think. Yeah, and then I also understood, you know, I entered a lot of competitions and place that was accepting it. So I realized like uh, a certain technical velocity was respected for these competitions. They were all, all you were already up against the wall and it is the truth about playing uh, quote unquote classical repertoire on the saxophone and they would have an all-inclusive concerto competition. So I said, well, if I'm going to be competing with pianists and violinists and flutists, I have to have the same you know mechanics and velocity that they do. So, but yeah, I probably at that point, I was, I was thinking of that, like, you know, how to get past stage one, how to get stage two, you know, how to get the ultimate prize, which is just playing music, you know, having with an orchestra or something. Yeah. And, you know, um, there's a couple of things that, that are pro ways I want to go with this. Um, when it comes to practicing technical types of things, and I guess maybe the question would be how much time if anything, if you could even quantify this, how much time do you spend working on classical pieces versus time working on, on jazz pieces? Realistically, I try to do 50-50, but that's not life. So 
Yeah. Uh, a few weeks I'm, I'm premiering a, a repeat premiere of a new saxophone concerto by Giovanni Santos. And he's from the LA area. Uh, it's S A N T O S. So it's going to be the Cleveland premiere. It's a four movement saxophone concerto. And boy, is it great. So it's very hard for me to like not spend all my time focused on that. Right. And, and also try to run blues in every key. That was something that was really um, drilled into me. Like, if you want to really keep your jazz foundation, just take blues in every key, all every day. That was like just like brushing your teeth. You know, that's the, uh, you know, jacking the climbing um, or rhythm changes in every key. And it doesn't take that long. Just go up a half, a half step or down a half step every chorus. So I would do that. But right now, I, I'm, um, I'm just focusing on just playing classical. But I know I could still, if I had to play, if I had to swing tonight, it would be okay. So it, it's kind of funny because years ago I would do re concerts and recitals of both. Like the first half would be classical, and then the second half would be intermission and jazz. And they would, I would do that with orchestras. The first half would be like classical saxophone concertos, and the second half would be bird with strings. And um, I just have to get back to doing it. It's, uh, if I have a concert that allows me to do that, then I'll, I'll make sure that everything is everything's working. Yeah. Um, and I'm happy with it. It, it gets a little rough. <laughs> well, let me ask you this question, because I know people are going to be curious about this. Some people change their setup from classical to jazz. Do you do the same or do you use the same setup and you're just you're just changing the way you approach it mentally? A little bit of both. I do change the setups because I think I need to uh, do that for myself to really get a refined classical sound at P and this mo at A440 to 444 the opera orchestras and things. Uh, and then I just, you know, play on a, a Meyer, an old New York Meyer Vine for, for jazz. And then there's some Van Dorn mouthpieces I also play on that I really like. Um, and uh, George Reeder, that owns Rovner Company, just came out with a, a now jazz alto mouthpiece. And he's a great guy, George and Lynn. Yes, and they are. I, I put it on like two days ago. We were talking, and this is this was killing it. And I was like, wow. And it's I don't I guess it's not on the market yet. But uh, is it the Avatar or the Aviva? Because I, I I'm friends with them. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah Aviva, I think it's right, Aviva. Yeah, okay. I, yeah, it's it's great. I was like, wow. So there's, awesome. There's, but see, I try not to be a, a you know equipment gearhead really because then you just open that Pandora's box and. But it's okay to try things. I, I could, you know, I was I didn't try. I had the classical mouthpiece, which is a, like a Selma C Star, for like 30, 40 years, and I tried some of the Van Dorn pieces that came out. And those are great, especially for like chamber music settings for just like small classical ensembles, like maybe five or six people. Um, but I, I don't, I don't change up too much. And then, just getting into the whole gear talk, I had to have my wisdom teeth removed, um, like probably when I was forty, oh, so wow. I couldn't play that much. So I, I, I had, I said, well, I better use this time wisely. So I took the brightest mouthpiece I could find. Which was like a metal Beechler 10 something, 10 star. I don't know what it was. It's the brightest, edgiest alto mouthpiece. And I had like seven or eight in a row. And then at the at the end, I had an Adolf Sachs, like a Rasher mouthpiece, a copy of the Adolf Sachs original mouthpiece. And at the end of the day, um, I could make the Rasher mouthpiece sound bright and edgy. I mean, or at the end of the process, I should say, which is three months. So I could take the, the darkest classical mouthpiece wow. um, and make it sound like uh, a guy from Saturday Night Live. You know, like you'd get a, put a David Sanborn sound onto it, and then I took the brightest mouthpiece and I could I can make it sound like a you know real rich. I don't know. I just wanted to not waste time, but that really was eye opening because I realized that you'll you'll do anything. You could take any mouthpiece and really get the sound out of it that you want that represents you uh, yeah at the time i just didn't want to waste time i wanted to play but I, I knew i couldn't play that much so i just put them on and i played them every day and i was like wait a second then i started to dance around them so I would, um it really was eye-opening but uh, so 
um, I'm not trying to say like there's I guess my what I learned from that is like we as saxophone players will will speak how we want to sound musically through any mouthpiece ultimately. Yeah, and th- okay, this this and actually this goes a little bit full, full circle too because you know you talk about Charlie Parker, he just play any horn, any mouthpiece, any reed that that was given to him, and then you spoke before about. Um, you know, your practice routine and, you know, some of the people that affected you, you know, and it, it, yes, it was through a book, but Sigurd Rosher, right? Dave Liebman, um, Donald Sinta, all that type of thing is just so interesting to me because as I also play brass as well. So, you yeah. know, I just, I actually just stick with one mouthpiece. I know a bunch of guys that will use, I don't do lead playing or anything like that. So I can understand absolutely using a, a pea shoot <laughs> to, to, to do lead playing for sure. But you know, Vince Pensarelli would always say to me, you know, everything's up here. You know, you, you have to, you have to conceive the sound. You know, you have to, you know, have a childlike imagination and a curiosity and, you know, do lots of listening and you conceive the sound so it comes out from you. And I know that's in the Rasher book. A lot of people don't read the verbiage in there. They just do the exercises or they go right to the harmonic stuff. They don't do the beginning stuff where he talks about tonal imagination. Um, and when you right. mentioned- What's the reason why? Like, this is why to go through all this is, yeah, he's giving you the keys to the city and people just flip the, the introduction and they start on exercise one. I know. Yeah, I did it too. So. Yeah, because we just want to get to the goods, you know. Um, so, no, I totally get that. And even too, Donald Sinta with voicing, it, you know, it, that's brass. It's That's brass. That's the same thing, you know. Um, it's the same same um, concepts there. So, you know, it's, it's interesting, like you talked about your setups for classical and jazz. It's you know, it's thoroughly thought out, but what you just shared about, um, you know, making the darkest mouthpiece sound as bright and edgy as the brightest mouthpiece that you could possibly find, it all comes from up here. And it, and it, and that again goes full circle with, uh, what Charlie Parker managed to do, you know, just playing on any setup and making it work and still sounding like him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, uh, he had a lot of the different saxophones and, uh, we were discussing, you know, there's there's a few other books out there that just talk about him, you know, literally getting a horn and brought to him uh, for the gig, and he didn't know that, that mechanism. In fact, there's that, that YouTube footage of him and Dizzy playing on Hot House, and I know that horn was just given to him because the octave key is stuck, so if you really watch that footage, he's da 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 he pops the octave key open because it's, it's, it's stuck. He didn't even, he even test it and play it. You know, so the octave key is stuck at it from whoever played it before, and it's frozen. So he knew. And but the other thing that's amazing about that, he didn't miss a beat. He just flipped it with his finger and just kept on playing. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So I think saxophone players, if you really watch it, you know, I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty diehard student, so to speak. I mean, I, I picked up on that. It says, wait a minute, that's what happens. Look, that's what we all do. And it's you know, trying to try to open up a key if it's sticking or stuck. And, you know. But just the fact that it was it just. Got that horn, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> popping up the octave key. That's that's too funny. Well, let me let me ask this question then. Um, and I was thinking about this before we even came on today. Um, with all the research that you've done to Charlie Parker, playing his songs, playing his pieces, all that kind of thing, what do you think Charlie Parker would be like today? What kind of you know player would he be, and would he be? Oh, especially today. It's so different than than his time, of course. But with all the social media noise, would he be that iconic, you know, master that you know we would have would we know him of him, or would he just be just like many of these great players that are out here right now? I, I think if Charlie Parker was alive today, he would he would probably be uh, maybe overwhelmed with everything that, that he could get his hands on. I mean, music from different countries, music from like Syria, from Greece. I mean, certainly that was out there. Uh, and Bird would uh, gravitate to anything and everything he wanted. He wanted to study composition with Edgar Perez, you know. Um, so he would just probably be more of just a larger sponge. And what, what he didn't like, he would probably just shy away from. But what he would like, he would probably just just expand it and explode it. And that's why I always you know, think about someone such as like Kenny Garrett, who's, you know, probably living that um, ideology 
um, now. You know, he's certainly his own person and genius, but I know he, you know, studies different languages, like you know, speaking Chinese and Japanese and, and Korean. And, wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, oh, <laughs> that's, that's overload. So do, so do you think that, um, you, you mentioned the word overwhelmed and, you know, it, it, you mentioned in terms of like all the music that's around, you know, all around the world and stuff and having access to that. But I'm also thinking from a social media point of view too, you know, you, I, I just try to imagine this, you know, Charlie Parker being around now, let's say he's in his twenties or thirties and seeing him on like Instagram or <laughs> Or something oh, like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think he would he'd probably be playing like a lot of things we don't expect him to be playing. I know uh, and here we have these again coining these terms. I know uh, he would be gravitating to probably things I would think of film music. Film music is so exciting and, and vibrant. I mean all living composers, and it could be whatever style, you know, the reggae, hip hop, or these, um, you know, all these great classical composers out there that are writing for new, new pieces for symphonies and things like that, which is a big undertaking. So he would, yeah. he would probably be part of the best of the best. And if things weren't the best, he would probably integrate himself to make it better. You know, um, I, I think he would jump on anything and everything and just enhance it. Uh, not, not that that was his goal or it would be his goal, but he would just want to be like, wow, what about this and that? You know? It's part of his think, personality. Yeah. And just like being with, with players that are better than you are currently. I mean, we all gravitate to, I like to play with players that motivate me and inspire me um, and make me think a little bit and make me, you know, work to my potential. It could be a drummer, it could be a conductor. I've had conductors push me uh, in that idiom and that genre. It's, it's hard to nail down one specific, but making me work more in the performance instead of just like taking like, okay, that's fine in dress rehearsal and pushing and taking chances, like, you know, just not having it, um, not, not playing things safe, you know, being a little exciting and things like that. So, yeah. That's really cool. It's just, it's just something that, that I was thinking about as, you know, watching your Know the Legend project and stuff like that. And I'm curious too, um, with this Know the Legend project, so we have the YouTube video, is anything else going to come of this or are you thinking of doing a Know the Legend for another composer or another artist? No, uh, I just think that's going to like marinate, so to speak. I, I know the History Channel and PBS are interested in it. Oh, great. So uh, it, it'll, it'll kind of do, it, it's its own entity. So it'll, it'll start growing. Uh, I, I don't actually even own the rights to it, but the NCPA will probably, you know, allow whomever wants to release it in different countries. Um, so I think that Dalton's interested in it, you know, being the birthplace of Adolf Sachs. Um, so whomever wants to just get involved with it, plus, uh, you know, just like on, on one things are, you know, released on YouTube, the whole world owns it, you know. And I feel bad for these. I think that's why they're so uh, protective of these Marvel movies. <laughs> you know, that is, they, you know, everyone's looking for, like, what's happening in 2025 with Thor 7 or something like that. And I think it's kind of crazy. Not in a bad way. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm just thinking, you know, um, I know you don't know on the rights to this, but just a thought, this would be great to get in the hands of jazz education network um i know you were part of iaje um you know back in the day but to get in the hands of jen but also like state music organizations um i'm from new york so i think about nisma and stuff and we have like you know the jazz all state auditions and jazz nisma and all that kind of thing but just getting in the hand of music teachers yeah i don't know how that process works I and mean, i should I, a little bit of research you know um yeah, I, I think it's all, it's out there for people basically to, to learn from and be educated about. Like, I always, which I alluded to in the documentary, like, you know, there, there's some serious publications out there that talk about Parker being um, named Bird or Dean Bird because of his playing with velocity and I, I, 
there's there's so many there's too many publications about that you know <laughs> and uh, it's okay i mean but it's wrong you know it's okay but that's not how it works that's not the truth of things so. That was another story, too, that I thought was really fascinating from from this project as well. Um, I'm going to I'm not going to ask you to share that here because I want people to watch <laughs> and we're going to share the link in, uh, you know, on our saxophone podcast dot com website website in the description. For sure, I want people to watch this project because I think it's it really is just so fascinating. And it you know, it's also the art of storytelling, too. You know, that's another theme from this podcast, too. Um, you know, your rich foundation being around, you know, like all these incredible players in the Buffalo area, then also in Connecticut as well. And your your connections with Jackie McLean. Um, but also, you know, in, in terms of richness, in terms of storytelling, like with the people that you were associated with, just hearing all these stories. I think it's just truly fascinating. I think, uh, you know, especially for the younger generations, they are more story driven. Yeah, I, I think you're definitely right, Tom. I, uh, and it, it's important to, to know the facts with history. History morphs a little bit. Um, I know there was a book, uh, I think it was called The Devil's Horn, I believe, about saxophone. Yeah, that sounds familiar. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure, but within it, um, it, it talked about that um, Jimmy Abato or Vincent Abato disliked Parker Stone. And that was the exact opposite. Parker came to Vincent Abato because he was playing with strings, burger strings, and he wanted to get a sweeter sound. So somehow in, in the book, it's, um, and, and you know, Vincent Abato never liked that. He said, you know, before you, you know, pass away, can you straighten that out? I, I did an article in Sax Journal. And it wasn't like, it could have just been misinterpreted, but he really uh, was upset about that. You know, as he read it, he was like, he said that he, he goes, oh, my God, I thought that young man was a genius. He loved the sound. He says, well, you don't need to sweeten up. You know? but somehow it got lost in translation. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, before before we go, um, first of all, thank you so much for your time as it is. But I wanted to know, are there any you know, aside from the premiere of um, that piece, the Santos piece, that's going to be coming in a, up in a few weeks. Um, is, are there any other projects coming up in the next six months for you? Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, not really. I mean, I, I always play at a club called Brothers Lounge in Cleveland, which is a nice place to play. Um, was, I mean, I always do workshops and master classes at various schools. And, um, oh, that's, uh, of all places, Almaty Kazakhstan. I, I met a conductor on wow. one of these tours pre, pre-COVID, and they have a great orchestra there. So I'll probably play some, if I could, I know some musicians in Eastern Europe. Um, I mean, really wow. great players. So do bird with strings and their Almaty Symphony in Kazakhstan. Wow. <laughs> and then that's a, you know, that's a, uh, people have misconceptions about that country. It's, a, it's an oil rich country. It's a wealthy country. It loves the arts. Um, the conductor's name is uh, Maestro Mara Besengalia. And um, he's heard me play. So we've been in communication. So hopefully that'll happen sooner than later. You know. Wh- which pieces are you thinking of? Uh, probably Bird with Strings. And then, you know, they would probably like the Glazunov concerto being so close to Russia. And why not? You know, I, I one time, Donna, I played the Glazunov concerto probably more than anyone else in the history of the composition. And the only reason why it's not bragging rights is I played it uh, every day, twice a day throughout Europe for three weeks. So I had a morning performance of a kitty show, and then I had an evening performance, then we went to another city. And this happened when every day i think there was like 35 performances in wow. in three weeks of that alone so and someone's like aren't you ever tired of that well joshua bell's never tired of violin tchaikovsky violin concerto and because he always played it differently so there was not one time where it was you know the same thing it's always different i mean i, I what i'm getting at is like i never get tired of playing it it's great you don't get tired of playing the blues so i guess that's more what you alluded to earlier like you know, B flat blues is great. It's what you play over it. And Glazunov and everything else is great. It's how you play it. And that's interesting that you said that you don't necessarily play it 
the same each time, even though it's classical music. Like the the assumption is that classical music, it's got to be the same way every single time, you know. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, it has to be in tune, right dynamics, right articulation, and everything else, right rhythm, of course. But within that, that's just the, that's just like blocking it in. You know, you can, there's so much you can do with it. You just have to use your imagination a little bit. And there's that magic word imagination too, for sure. You know, and that, that goes, you know, that goes right back to the top with, you know, how Charlie Parker practiced is it was with imagination. It was taking just the one toy <laughs> or block that he had and doing every single possible conceivable combination that he could imagine with it. And it wasn't because he had to, it's because he wanted to. Yeah, uh, touche. And I think that's, you know, like, um, I'm a pretty relaxed person. I mean, I, you know, I'm pretty methodical about practicing and, you know, I have fun with this. But my students, you know, if, if, if they quote unquote play a wrong note, there's no wrong notes. That's what lessons are about. The idea of this, you know, you play everything great and right and you get a pat on the back. You know, you, you want to you really want to learn what you need to develop and get, you know, make some progress on. And also reinforce what you're good at, which is fine. Reinforce what you're good at, know what you need to work on. You're, we all have kryptonite, so there's always something that you have to work on. It could be high register, low register, whatever it is. That there's always, you know, uh, you know. I don't know. Uh, Parker had to have it. I don't know what it is, but I, I'm not sure. He didn't. You know, I I, I think to say Coltrane and his like latter recordings. Um, he kind of left us with that. Now that's in, in two measures on interstellar space. That's like it sounds like when I first heard that, I thought it was like three saxophones. It was just you know. So there's um, he left us with that. Mind-boggling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what? What would really be awesome? Just again, imagining if Charlie Parker was around today, where everybody you know records everything, right? You know, lots of videos of their playing. I would be fascinated. I think everybody would, if he was growing up today, if he had recorded his practicing, what he does, I think that would be, that would be incredible, actually. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a set, I don't know, I, I, there's a set of his, and it's, it's not like him practicing per se, warming up, Dean Benedetti uh, has a, I'm trying to think, a mosaic, it might be. I'm not even sure if it's available, but it's him like doing random things like warming up, practicing, you know, putting the saxophone together. Um, it's not on Verve. I think it's Mosaic. Uh, and it's the set of, it's, it's, so he's not, he's like doing snippets of songs, things like that, cadenzas and stuff like that. And, and there's a person was a, a saxophone player that followed him around with a recording device. And, uh, oh, wow. Yeah. I wasn't even aware of that. That's 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 really interesting. And so you mentioned the word D. Ben, you mentioned D. Benedetti. D. D. Benedetti. Awesome. This is so cool. Well, listen, Greg. Thank you so much for your wealth of knowledge and you know the storytelling. And I'm absolutely going to be you know uh, putting the link for the uh, Know the Legend project. But actually, before we go, how can people find you? Oh, well, just gregbanishack.com. And we will put the link in the show notes. Um, are you on social media? Like, you know, are you on um, like Facebook and Instagram or one? Oh, just Facebook. And, and that's my, we were talking about, you know, um, boy, I, I'm, I should really get you know, all my friends and uh, former students. Are like, I'm not tied into social media. That might mean I have a Facebook page and it's like a pro page or whatever. But I, 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 I'm not in tune with all that. I should really. You know, know all the 88 keys on Facebook. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> no, you know what? I, the way I look at it, face, um, social media, you know, there's definitely a purpose for it, but you're spending your time creating, you're spending your time performing, and that's what you're doing, you know, and, and social media is its own beast that does take up a lot of time. You know, and um, I think in some respects, you know, if you're spending all your time creating that, that's going to be more important than being on the socials. Yeah, it'll all work out. You know, it's, it's OK. Definitely is. <laughs> well, listen, Greg, thanks so much for your time again. My pleasure, Donna. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs>